I want to uh, say hi on the A Minute to Midnight show to all our listeners. My name's Tony, and today I have with me my A Minute to Midnight teammate, Joni Stahl, and a frequently recurring guest who's a friend of ours, Mike, from On Point Preparedness. I think this is going to be a great show. I'm really looking forward to it. So welcome to the show, you two. Thanks, Tony. Hey. Yeah, hey, thanks, Tony. Nice to be back again. Excellent. Hi, Mike. Hey. <laughs> yeah, it's great to be having you both on the show today. So uh, we've got a few things to cover. I think some pretty important stuff. Uh, first off, let's go to Mike, I think. Mike, you've got a few things that you wanted to share, um, and I think they're quite important as well. So how about we start off with you? Right. And so this is actually a continuation of where the three of us really left off in our last interview. So it was myself, Joni, and Lee from Philia Ministries, and we were all sort of interconnected. We were brought together by the Lord to tell people that we're really close. I mean, we're really close to some epic things happening in our world. And the main theme of that conversation was, you know, persevere in our faith, endure in it. Uh, times are going to get hard. And also that we can't really pray this away. This is going to happen. It is written, so therefore it will occur. And then the three of us had a really great expansion on that talk. And so I guess the, the best way for me to lead us in here is that I've really been continuing with that theme. I've published three videos over the last, I think, two, two and a half weeks. And they've all been about persevering in the faith. Because as we know, and uh, I think it's Matthew 24, or when it talks about the end times, it says that there will be a great falling away. And if we take a look at the scenery of Christianity today, um, I've always thought that uh, Christianity, the false Christianity, is one of the biggest dangers to the remnant church compared to Islam and some of the other world religions. With Islam and Buddhism and, and all these other world religions— You've got a demarcation line in the sand. You know, you know where they stand. You know that they're not with Jesus Christ. It's it's very distinct. If you think about it in military terms, you know, you've got um, skirmish lines. You've got people in one set of camouflage and then the other in another set. But with the false church, you know, the false Christianity doctrines that are all floating around us nowadays, it's like terrorism. You know, there's... There's no more of these demarcation lines. Um, it's it's gotten to the point where it, it's hard to trust anyone, right? That's what I get from a lot of my subscribers is, oh, you know, we're, we're constantly trying to find people that um, our spirit agrees with. And it's just so difficult because the Internet has so much proliferation of these false doctrines, of these false churches. And um, I hate to say it makes people paranoid, but it, it is very, very difficult. And so that's really been the theme of my videos is that we are in some very deceiving times. We cannot let our guard down and we need to persevere in our abiding in Christ. And so I've really, I really, really feel that my past three videos have been from the Lord. Uh, there's, there's no way that I could have just thought of these things. And, and when they did hit me, it was one of those moments where it's incredibly powerful and the first one was really comparing the end times to the wedding ceremony. Uh, the second one was where a parable came to me. It's like a modern day parable talking about building a house. And it also relates to how we must persevere in faith. And then the last one was uh, just really about how um, judgment is a two-sided coin. And so a lot of people, we know that if someone dies, we really shouldn't say that they're condemned to hell. You know, that's that's definitely not our place. The judgment seat is for Christ. Um, but the interesting thing is that we don't think about too much is judgment is a two sided coin. You're either judged righteous uh, by by getting covered by the blood of Jesus Christ or you're judged uh, as lost. You, you die in your sins. And with judgment as a two sided coin and people typically only, you know, 
getting a bad taste in their mouth when you say that someone's going to hell. What about the opposite? What about when you say in the affirmative, oh, you're definitively going to heaven? Um, no one really no one really says anything about that. And so I've really related it to uh, the doctrine of eternal security. Uh, you know, when someone is saved at, say, 20 years old, and some churches say, oh, you are saved, and therefore you are eternally secure from this moment onward. My point about that last video was, and I know this is contentious with some people, once saved, always saved doctrine, and the proponents of that versus those that don't believe in it, it's always very contentious. But my position is that, you know, when you say in a in a spirit of finality that at this point when you are saved, you are secure from this point all the way through your death, all the way through eternity, it's almost like you're stealing the judgment seat of Christ. Um, in my in my opinion, it's uh, you know, we can definitely tell who is abiding in Christ and who bears the fruit of the spirit. But to say, and again, in the spirit of finality, that at this point, oh, yeah, you're definitively going to heaven. Um, I think that's just very dangerous grounds. Curious on on your thoughts, Joni. I know that you've seen the videos. Tony, I know yeah. you, you need to get caught up. But Yeah, I mean, yeah, I do. And, you know, I, I have to say that, um, and well, and before I say what I'm going to say, uh, this is after really, really digging in for years because I want to know for myself about, you know, eternal security. And so what I'm going to, what I'm going to say is what I have affirmed in my beliefs and, you know, really just studying and everything. But, you know, the, the word makes it pretty clear. You know, for me, I see it as clear. I know there's Calvinism. I know there's Arminianism. I'm not even going to touch that um, because during Jesus's day, there was no, you know, Calvin wasn't alive and Arminius wasn't alive. But I don't believe in a once saved, always saved. I don't say that to be inflammatory or to cause any debates. But I don't believe in once saved, always saved. I believe that you can walk away from your faith. Um, uh, and uh, and in regards to what you're saying, Mike, you know, there there is some words that back that up in Matthew chapter 13 about the parable of the wheat and tares. You know, the servants of the Lord, remember, they went out and they sowed the good seed. And then, as it was said, while men slept, tares grew up among them. And when they saw that, they went back to the master and they said, Master, didn't you sow any, didn't you sow good seed? Behold, tares are growing up in the midst of the wheat. And they, he said, an enemy has done that. And he, they said, well, would you like us to go and root them up? And he said, no, but let them grow together. And at the end, at the mm -hmm. end, then they can be rooted out. So... The bottom line with that, I believe that there's also a scripture that says there are some men's sins open beforehand going forth into judgment. I think that that was Paul's way of saying there's some men that are just very wicked. They are openly wicked. When they die, they die. And, you know, like, look, at I, I'm, I'm going to be extreme Hitler. OK, now all of us are going to look at a guy like Hitler or Aleister Crowley. You know, I'm, I'm being extreme with some really wicked mm -hmm. people here. I think it's fairly safe to say with regard and respect to Jesus Christ as the judge, okay, that these men did not go into the immediate presence of the Lord. But those are extreme cases. I think that, you know, even in things, and I'm just going to touch on this real quick, so I don't want to take up all the time on this answer. Like, for instance, people talk about, let's say, suicide, okay, and they'll say, well, he went to hell. And I have seen the most awful things people have written uh, in comments like, well, he went straight to hell. And I'm like, wow, because there's a lot of people that suffer pretty bad and they're Christians. And somehow maybe they have some kind of horrible bone cancer. Uh, I, there, There's a litany of reasons why people just break and they take themselves out. But that doesn't mean that I don't believe they went to hell. or they, did, You know what I mean? And so I, I believe that that is a respectful place to remain, what Mike is saying. So I think it's, again, a safe place and a position to take. Leave it to God. I think my position on that is I would question whether the person was ever saved to the to start with, um, whether whether they, rather than are they losing their salvation, because I, I wonder if it's 
how mm-hmm. well, you know, I don't know. Again, as you say, Joni, I leave it yeah. up to God. But, yeah, my question would be, you know, wondering if someone actually does walk away, I wonder how genuine their conversion was to right. begin mm-hmm. with or did they just think they can just uh, kind of buy their way into heaven by making some little prayer or something. Mike. Mm-hmm. Well, that that's a really good point, and I actually addressed it in my last video. And my my point of it is, is uh, proponents of once saved, always saved will come to me and they'll say, well, if someone goes through a baptism and they say that they're saved and then over time they start falling away and then their sins really start to make everybody uncomfortable, they'll say, well, they were never saved in the first place. And my point is here that if you, if they were, if they confessed to be um, in Jesus Christ, and then you taught them the doctrine of once saved, always saved, and then they started falling away, and in your own mind you step back and say, oh, maybe they were never saved to begin with. What burden have you put on yourself by telling that person that they were eternally secure? Mm. You know, you know what I mean? Yeah. I, I will not bear that burden to propagate a doctrine to say that if you're saved, that you're eternally secure when I don't know if you're saved. That's the whole point. Yeah. I mean, yes, yes, definitely. We have assurances like in Joni's example, Hitler or Aleister Crowley or whatnot, that yeah, people are definitely not abiding in Jesus Christ or those that are, we say, okay, we call them brothers and sisters in Christ. We can see the fruit of their spirit. Um, But at the end of the day, there's several verses in the Bible where, like in Jeremiah, who can discern the heart? And it's really the Lord. The Lord is the only one that can really discern the heart. And we are to seek out our own salvation, not each other's. So I I know where I stand, um, but I'm not going to look at Joni and question, you know, what she believes. Um, and so I, I just think it's a dangerous place to be, you know, where we're saying, well, he must have been saved or he must not have been saved because you you are sort of starting to straddle that fence of judgment. I um, am come to my mind th- uh, three things that Paul said. The first one is he said, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Uh, the second one he said was, lest I, you know, I'm preaching and lest I fa- find myself disqualified, which means even Paul was, I guess, questioning to some extent you know, that you can't just preach stuff and then find yourself disqualified because you're not, uh, you know, following your own preaching. But then at the end, he, he basically says, I've kept the faith, you know, and here, you know, I'm paraphrasing it, is laid up for me the crown of life. So he knew mm-hmm. at the end of his life that he had run the race and kept the faith. But perhaps there were times where he was, you know, questioning his own tenacity to, you know, make sure that it's, he kept that running that race straight. So, yeah, um, that's my thoughts. I, I don't have a definitive position either. I think it's in, in God's hands, Joni. Well, I mean, ultimately it is in God's hands, and we are given, you know, um, examples of people that, I mean, look at Judas for all. I mean, come on. He's the ultimate example of he was anointed. One of one of the 12 foundations in heaven were supposed to be his, the amethyst. OK, and he forfeited. He I mean, he was a, he was going around healing people, too. Remember, he said, behold, I've given you power to tread upon serpents and scorpions and over all the power the enemy possesses. He not only did that with them, he did that with the 70. But remember, the 70 left him, too. We have, you know, look at um, I mean, that was that's that's an extreme case. We have Ananias and Sapphira. Remember, I said, how is it that you have allowed? Remember, they came in and they said, how is it that you have allowed Satan to enter into your heart? that you would lie to us. And they were instantly, well, prejudged in a sense right there. They both dropped dead and were buried out back. Uh, We have Hymenaeus and uh, Hermogenes. We have them. We have Simon Magus. Remember, he said the magic words and he went on with them. And next thing you know, he said he was watching them do miracles in the name of the Lord. He said, you know, uh, pray for me that uh, I would also receive this power and I'll give you money for it. Remember, they cursed him. So, I mean, um, we have many examples. And as well as it says in Hebrews, for it is impossible for those who once have been enlightened, enlightened, who have tasted of the heavenly gift, 
who have been partakers of the divine nature and have been uh, part of the powers that are to come to fall away and to, you know, make the blood of Jesus Christ an open shame, trampling underneath it. So when he says it's impossible, we're talking, you know, he's talking about a true salvation because we're in this body of death. This body is created for this world and it's a body of death. And so there's always a war going on. There's so many examples of people who have fallen away, but they have come back. It could have been 10 years later, 20, 30 years. It could be back on their deathbed, but they returned. And in that moment, it was the Holy Spirit who bore witness with their spirit that they are the children of God. So what's the witness bearer of the Holy Spirit who does the witness bearing because he bears that witness of truth? So, but we do know that there are people that can walk away from their faith. What's happening at that moment of their death? I don't know. I don't know what's being said inside of their mind between them and the Lord. There's so many cases of people who have died or or went into a coma. And at some point, the Holy Spirit, they, they come out of it saying, I was getting ready to die. And Jesus Christ met me and he ministered to me. And while everybody's thinking, oh, poor Joe, he's dying, this is it, and we think he's not even saved, look at how he was, but we don't know that in those spiritual moments, within inside that spirit of the man, the Holy Spirit is ministering to him words of life, and he's receiving it. So we have to draw a line, you know, with, you know, I think pretty much everybody in most circumstances. Well, and I think mm-hmm. again to another one is Demas. Uh, Paul talked about him in a good sense in one of the letters, and I can't remember which is which, but then later on he said, yeah, uh, he has walked away in love with this present world. You know, so what does it mean he he was eternally lost? Who knows? I don't know. I guess the point is that people that sort of say, oh, well, you know, little Johnny gave his heart to the Lord when he was seven years old, and it doesn't matter that now he's a bank robber and, a, you know, and he's committed this right. murder and that murder, but he's going to heaven because he made a commitment, you know, when he was a little kid. My thing is, well, you got to question whether that how genuine they were uh, at that point, but well, ultimately it, it, only it, God knows, really, doesn't he? Well, and really, Jesus made it pretty clear in John chapter 7. I mean, as clear as we can take it as well as we're alive on earth. But he talks about the, you know, the um, the example of the good tree and the bad tree. They both bear either evil fruit or they bear good fruit. Or out of the overflow of the heart, the man speaketh, right? And then there's, of course, things that defile the body. There's all these different things. But I think just to maybe kind of round up this discussion so we can move on to other exciting things. This is exciting, too. Don't get me wrong. but so <laughs> Because we can keep talking about this because it's a great subject. But um, I just feel like, you know, if we circle right back around to what Mike was saying, um, we'll leave the judgment to God, right? There's only one that sits on the judgment seat. Yeah. So <laughs> I guess I'll... Uh... I'll just have one quick thing. Uh, the interesting thing, and maybe I'll do a video on this as well, but the word for judgment, judgment was translated from the Greek, and there's actually three different Greek words for judgment. There's krino, krima, and crisis. And so the interesting thing is when when all three of those Greek words are translated to judgment, it loses its context. And so there are some parts of the Bible which talk about how we are to judge um, the world and and angels. And that form of judgment is called crino, and it's a form of correction. So, you know, some people say, oh, don't ever judge your brother and sister. But no, the Bible actually says that we have the word of God, and we are to provide correction to each other so that we stay on the straight and narrow path. Mm -hmm. But then the, I forget exactly what judgment it is reserved for Christ. It might have been crema or crisis, but that is the final judgment. Yeah, that's Mm -hmm. the one we just don't want to touch because that has been completely allotted for Christ's decision. Exactly. Yeah, because you, what you're bringing up is first uh, Corinthians chapters five and six, you know, that we're to judge the things that, and you're using that word, that Greek word, uh, to judge those things that be in the body, who are we to judge those things are without, you know, they have their judge, judges to do that. But, you know, he gives some pretty basic examples. If you see as a, a man with his father's wife and you put up with it, that, you know, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And you just live with it. Well, obviously someone needs to talk to that person, but it's just to keep order 
and you know, and the body needs to be clean, right? Otherwise, everybody becomes we're a body. And if somebody comes in with sin and no one brings a proper correction to that, it says that we're all partakers of it. So, I mean, it has some serious consequences spiritually. Yeah, true. Now, Mike, com- coming back to you with the uh, whole move towards a global religion and the falling away, because that's where you sort of began this. What are your thoughts about what's going on in that area at the moment? So, and I actually need to pull this article up, but uh, you are aware of the the Pope movie that is coming out. I think it's, uh, let's see here, that would be sometime this summer. So it's called Pope Francis, A Man of His Word. It's basically a full featured film where they are saying that he is essentially the moral authority of the world. And we know a whole lot of world religious leaders are really looking to him as Again, the moral authority. I, I equate him. This just came out of my lips during uh, one of my videos. But I really foresee him as the anti-John the Baptist. He's the he's the John the Baptist of the Antichrist. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. And Good he analogy. is paving. I, I know. Like when I didn't even really prepare that or think that. So maybe it was from the Lord. I don't know. But um you know, I think when the world is in chaos and disarray and we start seeing some really crazy supernatural things, uh, religion will definitively come into the picture. It already you actually see a resurgence of religion um, here in the States and elsewhere, which is something we might talk about on the show. Um, but when we're getting into this theme of religion and spirituality and supernatural things, this is the guy, you know, he, he's the one that's going to help people understand what it is. It's going to be a false understanding, but they're going to be looking to him. Um, But yeah, he's got that big movie coming out. And the other thing that I was talking with Joni about earlier was Trump had, um, what did he do? He nullified the Johnston Act. I think that's what it was called. It was, uh, had some provisions for separation of church and state and how you could donate money and things of that nature. And I, I believe he abolished that. So again, it was the merging of church and state just by another degree here in the States. But um, Francis Macron, he's actually starting to merge church and state. And I need to look up the article to what he's doing, but he is almost um, following lockstep with what Trump is. And so you, you already sort of see them, again, paving religion in, uh, into the minds of people. You know, it's almost like uh, M- Macron is um, is a modern day Constantine. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, because during his day, during Constantine's day, there was so much uh, political unrest with the religion, and so what he did is he officialized the Catholic, making it the Catholic Church, and that way, you know, it stopped all his infighting. Um, I do know that there was some kind of a I was reading that art, an article about something in 1905. I looked up an article in France in 1905. They secularized that nation. So it's very hard in a sense to have faith, you know, a, a common ground. I mean, to have a recognition of a church. And the interesting thing is everything I was reading, they were, he was, t- it was talking about how he wants to, Unite church and state. He kept. They kept saying he kept being quoted as saying Christianity, Christianity, Christianity. Every other line was Christianity. But it's so interesting because I go back some years as a you know as a Christian, and I remember years ago, over forty years ago, Catholics would never refer to themselves as Christians. I remember talking to people that were Catholic, and they would say, uh, "I'd be like, um, I'd be, oh, are you a Christian?" They'd be like, "No." No, we're not Christians. We are Catholic. Now, it's interesting because many couple decades after that, I remember Catholics starting to call themselves Christian. Now, it's very interesting, too, because they started changing their services into uh, what looks like a born-again believer's worship. You know, that would be, of course, mainstream Catholicism. And not to mention, if I just say this part, and we'll go back to Macron, um, is there's a major return to Rome that's going on with the uh, Christian churches. I mean, we're talking a return to Rome. 
like come come home to daddy and everybody's getting all giddy over it you know i'm serious i see you guys smiling over there but it really is true i know you guys why you're smiling but it's true right i mean you guys see it i covered it in a video on the new world order um which is constantly still getting comments every day at the moment where i dealt with kenneth copeland and um his talk about the protest being over and 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 coming back to Rome, and he's kind of the cheerleader for it. So, and yeah, so yes, definitely agree with that, Mike. Oh yeah, and the, I did a video too where uh, the Roman Catholic Church is also known as the Holy Mother Roman Catholic Church. Mm-hmm. And again, if you start looking into the prophetic chapters and the symbolism, it's my belief that Mystery Babylon represents. Um, not necessarily Catholicism. I, I think we're going to have a new one world Babylonian religion, mm-hmm. but it's going to be led by Pope Francis and these these Catholic roots. Um, but the mystery of Babylon is a woman. It's the anti-church. And it's just interesting that they call themselves the mother, <laughs> you know, a female figure um, to whereby all these other Catholic denominations are going to get absorbed into. Well, and don't forget, you know, the woman that rides the beast She's an amalgamation of all the religions supported by the beast. It's an amalgamation of all the religions. Okay, now everyone's free. Now everybody just, you can believe whatever you want because it's a one world religion. It's global. It's a globalist religion. Um, Of course, it's godless and the beast system supports it. That's why she sits on him. And it is pretty classic, you know, you, you know, for we would get into details of, Revelation chapter 17 and 18, but we're not. <laughs> the thing is, uh, you know, talking about the seven mountains and, um, and of course, in chapter 17, when it talks about the fact that, you know, there's, there's arrayed in purple and pearls and the golden cup in her hand. And, you know, we can reference that back over to Jeremiah and, you know, the golden cup and all of that, you know, chapter 50, 51, 52. Um, but, you know, uh, this whole return to Rome thing, I remember back in the mid-90s, uh, there was this new channel called EWTN, Eternal Word Network Television. It was the first Catholic station, and it was uh, competitive in a big way with TBN. And, of course, you know me, the researcher, I'm like, I'm watching this now. And there was literally a show called The Road to Home. <laughs> and there was this guy on, and he was having pastor after pastor after pastor. That was back in the mid-90s. Having pastors come on tearfully, oh, I can't believe I finally made a home. I'm so happy now. Then they go back to their congregations. And it's interesting because even um, Copeland does this. He allows everybody to stay in their born-again idea in their churches Yet at the same time, he's selling them Catholic tokens. And so they're embracing an amalgamized form of Christianity. You know, the, and it's we're talking two different complete doctrines. And the Catholic doctrines, the Vatican II Council, of course, of course, it goes all the way back to further than that, um, is that they hold uh, 12 sacraments. One of the sacraments is, Unless you are part being water baptized, I don't mean full submersion, just sprinkled, that you are now under the covering of the Catholic Church, but there are 2,000 anathemas outside of that. So it's so interesting because I think to myself, if you only knew who you were striking hands with and telling you, saying you're going back to Rome, because if you're not going to fully be baptized into the Roman Catholic Church, then you're forsaking Christ, you're adopting a complete and total doctrine of demons, and you arrive at nowhere. Because we believe in a born-again experience, blood-bought born-again experience. Yeah, good point. Uh, and I, I don't know personally whether, I'm I'm still not sure that Rome is the center of the Babylonian religion, final religion, uh, it may be, I'm not convinced completely, but one thing I will say here is that I find really interesting is that um, Peter actually in the Bible talked about Babylon and he was referring to it as Rome at the time. And it's really interesting that the Vatican or St. Peter's Square and supposedly uh, Peter's meant to be buried there 
you, you know, it's it's really interesting that um, that it is in Rome, and so perhaps that is the center of the Babylonian religion. Yeah, perhaps. Also here, just going back to Macron, I, I pulled up the, the articles here, and I, I think this is actually pretty interesting now that we're talking about Rome. But the article that was just published six days ago states, Socialist outraged as French president says Christianity can cure the economic malaise. So I guess he met with the Catholic Bishops mm-hmm. Conference of France and 400 guests at a college in Paris and basically sought their input on how to, you know, cure the economic woes. And when I did a Google search for that, it actually pulled up a different article, which was from last year. So this is May 17, 2017. Pope Francis urges Macron to strengthen France's Christian roots. So there you go. You have the lead guy, Pope Francis, a year back telling Macron what to do. And he's just being a good little boy and following what his master tells him to a year later. That is very interesting, especially mm-hmm. in light of what you mentioned earlier there, Joni. Well, you know, and really um, just to say this and what I've studied, and it's a basic study about the Nicolaitans. First church mentioned it was Ephesus. Remember, he says, I know your works and your labor and how you and such and such, you know, but you've left your first love, therefore return, repent and all that. And he says, However, you do have this one thing, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans of that which I also hate. He said that of the church of, you know, the the second church after that. Um, And what is, who are the Nicolaitans? You have to look at the fact that in uh, back during the um, captivity, remember they had to go into captivity because they didn't give the land rest. So they had to go 70 years into captivity into Babylonian Assyrian captivity. Well, when they went in there, the priests and, and the, you know, them, of course, the priesthood having children, having more sons and more sons, they began to emerge, not emerge, to merge their Judaism with Babylonian black magic mysticism. Now, there, that is where you get the Pharisees, which me, and they were referred to as the Tanayim meaning the separated ones. So by the time Jesus comes on the scene and he's angry at them, you see such anger that Christ has with them in particular. I mean, he's very angry with them. That's where you get when he says, call no man your father. A lot of people have a, they're they're, They don't understand. They say, Oh, well, you know, that just, that is, um, it, it contradicts itself because if we're to honor our father and our mother, but yet he's saying, uh, Call no man your father. He was not talking to the people. He was talking to the Pharisees. And yes, the people were around him when he said that, because during that during the time of their captivity and the buildup of that uh, modified Judaic religion that was, you know, merged with Babylonian black magic mysticism, they had a priesthood and they called each other father. Okay. So by the time Christ died, buried, resurrected, gospel goes out, there was a guy named Nicholas. He was a proselyte of Antioch, and he began to Judaize the the church, and he started a big kind of a revolution where he blended together Judaism, that black Babylonian mysticism, and Christianity. That's where you get the church of Thyatira. So in essence, when you say return to Rome, you are basically saying return to Babylon because all of the uh, ceremonies that they do, the Eucharist, the mitre, the monstrance, all of those things, they go their root. When you trace the roots back to that, it's not Istanbul or, you know, or I mean, Constantinople, Istanbul. Um, It goes all the way back to their priesthood, the Babylonian priesthood. So it's kind of interesting when you see how we're looking at America being called today Mystery Babylon. And now there's this return to Rome. The vat, you know, the, the vicar Vatican means divining serpent. I mean, there's this guy is Christ incarnate. When you look at him, you're looking at Christ. That's why they hallow him. The whole thing is based on mysticism. 
It's total mysticism. And its roots are Babylonian through the Jews that got tainted, the priesthood that got tainted. I think I made my point, which is, I think, rather interesting, don't you think? Yeah, and it's interesting that they call the Pope the Holy Father. Yep. That's right. And even your every priest, you know, I, I was born and raised in Catholicism, and you were taught that the priest is father, so Father and Cornelius, forget, father this. Yeah, and and of course the nuns, you know, and of course, you know, you remember the Vestal Virgins of Rome, we've all learned about that, we know who they are, um, but that nunnery comes from, there was um, a, the women that were part of the ba- black <laughs> Babylonian mystery school of religion, and they dressed like that. Their dressing is exactly like those women in Mystery School of Religion of Babylon. Look at his mitre. It's Dagon. It's the fish god. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we can go on and on with their symbolism, but it is not Christian. It is pagan occultism. I mean, look at they have Janus. They have the statue of Janus, you know, at the Vatican. We have that giant obelisk. It's It's a man's member that goes back to ancient Egyptian Osiris worship and their triune Godhead. So it's, it's chock full. The whole thing is, you know, of course now they throw in Jesus. So it makes it reputable. And like I always say, Satan needs Jesus. He needs the gospel because he'll take 99% of the truth to float 1% of his lie. And he's sold because they put the name of Jesus. And it's very clear If anybody else comes to you preaching another Jesus that we haven't preached or another gospel that we haven't taught, don't believe him. There's only one. There's only one truth. So that's all I got to say about that (laughs) because I could go on. Mike, have you got any thoughts on that before we move on? Oh, just uh, I don't know if you both saw my video. I I honestly can't even remember the title, but it was about uh, the gestatorial throne of the papacy. No, I so, haven't seen it. I did. Oh, you'll, you'll like that one, Tony, because uh, it's some real good visual. But uh, before the Pope Mobile, the Pope used to be carried on what was called a gustatorial throne. And so it was literally a very ornate throne that was hoisted into the air by 12 individuals, which represented the 12 apostles. And it was typically for ceremonial um, processes. But when they literally are carrying the Pope, in on this throne, he would also stand up and raise his hands to receive all the glory while everyone, you know, bowed their heads at him. And I found um, ancient Egypt uh, artist renditions that they have the exact same thing. The pharaoh and the princess were carried on a throne that was probably on the backs of 12 or more people. And even it goes down to the fans. So if you look up these pictures of the gestatorial throne, you'll see that there are two ostrich feather fans that are on either side of the gestatorial throne, and their root is from ancient Egypt. Uh, the ostrich feather fans were used to fan Pharaoh. And so <laughs> there, there's more than enough That's out right. there for you to see. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So, folks, um, I think, including me, i got to go see these these three videos. I haven't had a chance yet, Mike, but now, I will by the definitely way, that be doing good, it. Mike. Thank you. Yeah, it was really good. Well done. Everybody needs to check that out. Excellent. Okay, now, so that's the sort of the um, looking at the global religion and how we're moving towards that. And I know it will upset some people. Every time we touch the Catholic stuff, it does. um, And you never please everyone because it's either they, you know, why are you bashing the Catholics or you're not bashing them hard enough? You know, it's not designed to hurt you. Mike was raised a Catholic. I was raised a Catholic, even though I sort of had, you know, sort of Jewish roots as well. I was raised Catholic. Um, and there was some good stuff in it and a lot of stuff I'm so glad to have escaped from. So if there are any Catholics listening, believe me, um, you're it's way off track in many cases. If you're Catholic and you're listening to this, this is in no way a personal attack against you. And um, but this is about doctrine, and if we were talking about Mormonism or anything else, we would definitely pull up doctrine too. Um, so peace to you, not meant to hurt your feelings or anything. Yeah. All right, so. Yeah, so the other thing I want to look at a little bit, while we've still got a wee bit of time, 
is the global, uh, the financial side of things and um, how we're moving towards a beast system there. And Joni had a really interesting dream, which I'll get you to talk a little bit about, um, which I think ties in with this completely. Um, we are seeing the whole Syrian situation, uh, which is perhaps a distraction in some ways from what's really going on, which is a financial business going on behind the scenes. There's been no real hard evidence presented that um, Assad did, in fact, chemically assault his own people. Um, but they used that as a reason to do a strike. We've got John Bolton, you know, who's a warmonger in the Trump administration, which it shows you that war's coming, I think, more and more. But in the end, is I think it's meant to, it's actually a disguise for something else that's going on which is a move towards the global currency that is coming, and it's going to—it's sort of hiding what the Federal Reserve is doing. And um, there actually was a really good article I saw today, which ties in uh, with much of what I was thinking and wanting to talk about anyway. And it's called "The Syrian Conflict Is a Distraction from a Secret War," and it's written by Brandon Smith, and you can find it at altmarket.com. Brandon Smith is usually really onto it. Um, as far as anyone goes, he's about as good as it gets, I think, in understanding a lot of stuff, what's going on. Uh, so I won't, you know, for the sake of time, go too much into his article. I suggest people do go and read it. But what I do want to look at is um, the fact that it's moving, I think, ultimately us towards a global currency that's what's really happening the war is a distraction um, we're going to see probably rate hikes from the federal reserve and and winding down of a lot of a lot of things by central banks but it's it'll probably be blamed on donald trump um and you know we'll likely see stock market crashes and things coming but the whole thing is it's a deliberate de implosion of the financial system that's what i believe and it, we'll probably see some retaliation from um, fr uh, from Russia and China against the U.S. dollar because you know Trump's announced these trade sanctions and the, and different things, and it's basically a trade war. But the end goal is the removal of the U.S. dollar as the global currency. But it's not going to be the yuan um, or that is going to be the global currency. You know, people are saying that that's going to replace the dollar as a world reserve currency. I, I don't buy that. I don't believe that's what's happening. I think what is happening um, is a move towards a digital uh, currency system, which I will go into a little bit more. I'm going to cover a wee bit of that today. Uh, you might want to subscribe to our YouTube channel because I in, a, in May I've got Lynette Zhang hopefully coming on the show to um, ex expose even more of what I'm talking about here today like she's pretty knowledgeable on it. so you may want to if you're not subscribed to our channel actually subscribe so you don't miss that interview with her because it's going to be a blockbuster one but Joni before I describe what I think's going on how about you just give a rundown on this dream you had in the interpretation and I will have it up online when we put this show up hopefully yeah <clears throat> sure um I had this dream I believe it was in February and I'm just going to go ahead and say it, and then I'm going to just give a quick interpretation of it. Um, so it began as a day. It was just a normal day. I was in my house, and the phone rang. There was nothing special going on that day. The phone rang. It was an old friend and uh, someone I've known for most of my life, someone I'm not close to, but I know she's a Christian, and she was like, hey, uh, I moved right near you. Why don't you come over and visit me? And I was surprised because I didn't know she'd moved there and neither would I have known because we're not really close. And so I thought, well, yeah, I'll come over and check out your new house. And so it was so close. I walked there. And when I got there, her house was literally at the beach. And so I went through a gate, knocked at the door, but she opened it and she was like, Oh, hi. And, uh, come on in. But she wasn't even visiting with me. She was running around. She left the room and I was like, Okay, like she invited me to come over and 
she left the room. She's in some kind of hurry. And so I was walking around her house and it was this gorgeous, beautiful coastal home, everything in it. There was gorgeous artwork, um, beautiful things, very costly things, very beautiful. Uh, I could tell she was, uh, you know, and I, in real life, she is well to do. And um, so then she came out and I'm standing in the kitchen and she's like, she has her purse on and says, um, well, I have to go. I have to go. I'm, I'm in a hurry. I got to go, but you can stay. And she left. And I thought, I'm not staying. I, I don't even want to, I don't even know, really know why I'm here. If she's, if she's leaving, I'm leaving. So I left and I walked out of the gate and I've walked out in front of the fence. I'm standing in the sand. And I thought before I would start walking home, I would look out because I wanted to look at the ocean. And I noticed that the ocean was getting choppy. There was some kind of a radical wind that was coming in. The beach was deserted. Um, it was a vast beach. There was no one on it. And uh, I thought, wow, you know, a storm is coming and it looks like a bad one. And so as I was going to turn to go, I looked down for a second and I saw something shiny sticking out of the sand. So I squatted down and I, I pulled it out and it was this big disc like coin like it was a real coin it was like the size of a frisbee it was seriously that big i'm not trying to be funny i'm just trying to find something that would describe how big it was and it was solid gold and i mean it was the real deal and there was an image in the center of it and it was some kind of a an animal with a rider on it and i thought what is this I like I, I I was mind blown because it was like what is this? It's like a real coin, but it's so huge. And I looked down again, and all of a sudden I saw more shining gold pieces in the sand. So I put it the big disc under my arm to hold it, and I stuck my right hand in the sand to like sift, like you know, scoop it out. And my hand was full of gold coins. And the sand went through my fingers and I'm looking at all these gold coins and I was like, what is this? Like, and I started to, I took my other hand to look at the pieces and every piece was different. Not one was alike some, and I knew that they were gold coins that were currency. They were a new kind of currency because I could look and I can see on the coins, like, and I didn't write this in the um, interpretation or anything, but I saw one was Spain and I saw one was Portugal. I probably should write it in there. And I knew that every single coin represented a nation and some were super tiny and thin and crude and others were, you know, and have built up from their bigger, more polished, uh, more elaborate uh, images on them, thicker. Um, and so I stuck my hand in other hands. So now I'm holding two handfuls of coins like and the more i dug my hands in the more they started to appear everywhere and i i'm like well i can't i didn't even know what to do with what was in my hand i didn't know what to make of it but i understood in that moment that there was a new currency but i couldn't understand why it was in our soil and right then i had looked up because i had seen a group of people coming down the beach when I first walked out, which I didn't mention, but they were now walking up to me and I'm thinking, okay, I'm standing here with all of these gold coins from other nations in my hand and they're all over the sand and they walked by and they, I mean, I'm talking inches from me because they were going to go to the house that I just left from and they didn't even look at me. And they, I mean, the obvious coins in my hand, gold, big piles of it, but they were going to that house. And right then I turned around and I looked and my friend had pulled up really quick, got out of her car. She had two bags of groceries, went into the patio, put the bags down. She's pulling things out for a party and she's decorating everything. And I'm thinking, and right then I'm noticing now the storm is intensifying and it's getting worse. So I went to her and I said, look what I found and she didn't even bother looking and she could care less. And so I left thinking, okay, I'm not taking these home. And I threw them down. And 
before I left, I looked and I saw all those people, they were laughing, they were partying. And it was mind blowing to me because I thought, who throws a party in this beautiful elaborate house with this fierce, deadly storm coming? It was like they were dead to the fact that all these things were happening around them. And I said, I want nothing to do with it. And it was interesting because I wasn't invited. You know, only they were invited and they were more interested in partying and that kind of a thing. And I decided I'm going home and I woke up. So, yeah, that's really, really interesting. Um, you can mention in a, about the spiritual aspect of it with the deadness, you know, but my thought is immediately the gold, the large gold coin, the size of the Frisbee kind of thing, and then all the others, that's like the mother of all coins, the the, mm -hmm. the, the centre of the currency. And you have yes. all these other currencies, but they're all attached to that same yeah. giant currency and uh, and this is where it's going to tie in with what I want to share um very sh briefly in a minute but perhaps Joni you you may want to mention the the spiritual significance well the the spiritual significance showed that there's two houses there was my house and there was her house you're kind of almost looking at you know maybe a I'm not saying I'm re representing the parable of the five wise virgins but you know we're looking at two houses and we're looking at two women and the one woman we're talking about, we're both standing at the end of days. We're both seeing a radical, fierce, deadly storm coming and she's wealthy. She's throwing a party. She has no care or concern. This stuff was in her front yard outside. I mean, outside of, I mean, we're talking three feet in front of her fence in the sand and she doesn't even care to look. She's more interested in partying and, and the, and I thought this, this really, was a absolute picture of the postmodern Laodicean condition of the church. They're wealthy, you know, right? They said, we're rich. We have need of nothing. There's nothing that we want. But they were oblivious to something that was all around them. And that storm, I believe, is a storm that's coming upon our nation and it had to do with that currency because the currency and the storm and all the parts, they connect with one another. So absolutely, they're completely like part of a country club, so, you know, social club kind of a thing. And I looked at myself as somebody who just represented, not that I'm anything, I don't make myself anything. It's purely allegorical. But that I represented somebody who wasn't, I was a stranger to them and them to me. There was nothing in common. I was only invited to come and really just see her house and she abandoned me, which showed me there was a member. The Lord said in the end, the love of money will because sin abounds. The love of many waxes cold. There was no fellowship. There was no communion. There was nothing. It was empty, but yet they had it with each other. And I stood on the outside of that. So the Lord is showing me that there is really two camps. Remember we talked about that, Mike? Mm-hmm. Yep, about, absolutely. That there is really two camps. So the Lord is showing me that this is the spiritual condition of the broad road and the narrow road. So I'm going to leave it with that because I think people can pretty much get it. And I just uh, had one thought because I, <laughs> while you were you know, giving that dream, I started looking up some Bible verses. And the part that I found was interesting. Now, granted, you're in the California area, so... <laughs> <laughs> it sort of, sort of makes sense that you're on the yeah. beach. Um, but to, to me, the fact that you were in the sand on the beach was significant as well. So I looked up the symbol of sand, and sand is used for a variety of reasons in the Bible. It, it represents instability, but more often than not, it's used as a symbol to represent a countless multitude. And if we take that representation of sand as a countless multitude— I'm looking at Revelation 13, 1, and John says, And I stood upon the sand of the sea, and I saw the beast rising up out of the sea. So, so key thing here, I stood upon the sand of the sea. And if we go to Revelation 17, verse 15, when the angel is helping to describe the imagery that John saw, and the angel said to me, The waters you saw 
where the prostitute is seated are peoples and multitudes and nations and languages. So we have a direct reference to the waters being people of all sorts. And when we go and look at that verse in Revelation 13, it's saying the sand of the sea. And so I just find it interesting that these big gold coins are literally buried in the sea of people that worship this one world religion. Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Fantastic. Yep, you've nailed that. Um, it's, that was something I hadn't thought of. Obviously, Joni, you had neither. You've just added a whole piece to wow. that, the puzzle. <laughs> thank you there, Mike. Well, thanks, Mike. That was awesome. I reckon. Yep. See, Boy, that that thirteen one, uh, Tony really spoke, huh? Yeah, totally. And and again, it fits in so much with what I. I'll be honest, guys. As soon as we were going to do the show this morning, and I'd had a hectic day so far, and I read Brandon Smith's article, I saw read Joni's dream, and instantly I knew something that we needed to cover here. And um, and so you've just really put another whole piece in that puzzle. See, going back to Brandon Smith's article, I just want to read a little bit of it. An impending change in the global monetary framework is often referred to as the Great Global Economic Reset by IMF members like Christine Lagarde. This change will be f facilitated by central banks as they sabotage their respective national currencies through the creation and destruction of market bubbles. Ultimately, it will not be the Chinese yuan that replaces the dollar as a world reserve currency, but the SDR basket system controlled by the IMF. And the IMF has recently applauded blockchain systems and crypto as a potential rejuvenating force in international monetary transactions. Far from being opposed to cryptocurrencies, global elitists have been piling into them with praise and with investment dollars. The Global economic reset is not about East versus West. It is not about trade wars and nationalism. No, the global reset is about banker centralization of assets and consolidation of power. Now, that brings me to the point of, you know, something here that I really want to bring across. Now, ha have either of you heard of AC Chain or ACK Chain? Yeah. I actually haven't. No. Okay, well, you're going to be mind blown, I think, there, Mike. The ACK chain uses blockchain technology. It appears to have the IMF backing. It's touted as a fulfillment of the 1988 Economist magazine cover, i.e. it's probably got Rothschild banking. There's a video. It's about a three-minute video, which you've got to watch, okay? Now, in that video, this is just a very quick synopsis of it because Lynette Zhang hopefully will be on my show to break this down a heck of a lot more in a two or three weeks time um, and she's really looked into it thoroughly okay but here's just a very quick synopsis in that video and I will put the link to the video uh, in the description and also I'll put some pictures of it in in our little video with this show okay the Chinese are really big players in the video okay it's written and partially in Chinese and partially in English. So it's got both. The video begins with scales where gold is being balanced with various paper currencies. The fiat currencies are then swept aside or swept away by, get this, a robot hand, which represents artificial intelligence, and are replaced with Bitcoin and Ethereum. And these, in turn, become assimilated into the AC chain, which there is Joni's big coin, I believe. See, I, I'll be totally honest, folks. I think this is either the global beast currency, this ACT chain, or it's a forerunner for it. Okay, so that's what I think the big gold coin is. It's either ACT chain or something similar that's coming along. Okay, so Bitcoin and Ethereum are assimilated into the AC chain or ACT chain. The gold then is also replaced with cryptocurrencies and all these get weighed and assimilated into this AC chain. And then from there you see a phoenix rising from within flames and then it turns into showing the 1988 Economist magazine cover with the get ready for world currency, you know, which we know is 2018 according to that. 
We see it written in Chinese and in English. 2018 SDR digital currency will be born in 2018. A C chain. It eventually shows property, cryptocurrencies, money, everything being assimilated into the AC chain SDR. The words International Digital Exchange Council is also there, and AC chain stands for Asset Collection Chain. And I believe that this is um, likely to be, uh, you know, the, the beast currency. AC chain, according to their website, intends to create a decentralized and trustful, safer and more stable digital currency system to support free insurance, circulation and settlement of global assets as, to sup- as a supplement to and support for the world of fiat. Uh, this is the fundamental reason why the AC coin and AC chain special drawing rights, namely ASDR, were created. So uh, this is... I think the Chinese have actually been put in charge of developing this technology and we know, I've covered it before in other videos, that the Rothschilds have been diversifying into China for a number of years. Forget about the East, West, Russia and China versus the US. That may happen in a physical war, but in the end they're all together uh, under the world financial system working towards the same goal, which is to get rid of the US dollar as the world reserve currency and eventually replace everything with this global digital currency. Yeah, I'm I'm right there with you that we're going they're going to abolish cash. It's going to be some type of global digital currency. I did not know anything about the AC chain, but with what you described and how many tethers it has to things like the SDR and to Ethereum and Bitcoin, I mean that that definitely seems like a very um, valid currency that they would move to. I'm actually on the website right now, just checking it out. Yeah, go to the YouTube channel and watch the three-minute trailer video afterwards when you get a chance, because that sort of gives you a pretty good overview of of it. Um, and uh, yeah, so so I actually believe that this is what your coin dream, the coin section of it, is talking about, Joni, personally. Yeah, this is like really like especially when Mike brought up, you know, Revelation chapter thirteen one and you know, the other, you know, meanings of sand and sea and stuff like that. Um, I mean, that's explosive to me. It just really is. I mean, the timing could not have been better because I had that dream and I believe I believe it was February, but I sat on it. You know, I, I didn't really push it or anything. I remember telling you about it and stuff. And and then recently you were asking about it. And I was like, oh, yeah, you know, and but the timing is so excellent. You know, the way it just came out right now with this AC, this AC chain and yeah, new because, currency. Yeah, because I believe the AC chain is designed, it's still obviously in the early stages, but it's designed to be the currency that will include everything else into it. And I remember I had Norm Franz on the show at one point, and he talked about the beast system being everything being valued, he believed, including human beings, and everything will be have a value put onto it in a, sort of a digital system digital currency system and and i think a, a, this ac chain is either it or it's a forerunner of it but the fact that they're calling it an sdr uh shows you that this is this is not some little yeah somebody sitting in a room created a little That's currency right. right yeah this is international absolutely well where do we go from here <laughs> <laughs> i don't know that was yeah i like i i would say uh, I think it'll be really interesting to hear Lynette's take on this because I have seen her um, speak about it on, I think it was on the X-22 report uh, or one of those. So, um, yeah. Yeah, and you know something, it is, if you don't understand it, it's somewhat complex. I was looking into it myself, and I know what you're talking about, how it represents like, you know, they put it like, they made it look like a tree mm. and all these, like uh, uh, Mike used the word tethering, you know, like there's like all these tethered, currencies that are connected to it and it's still it's in its developmental stages but if they're making it a part of sdr and it's approved by the imf it's pretty much a done deal so the architects of it are just wrapping it all up and uh i believe that everything you pretty much said is true thus far that it is the one world currency system 
One other thing I want to add that kind of ties in with this is look at what's happening in India. According to the New York Times, the Indian oh, government yeah. oh, implemented yeah. an, you know, their identification system now is mandatory for 1.3 billion people who live in India. You can't take a baby home from hospital pretty much unless it has the um, retina scan and fingerprinting done. Uh, so they are, uh, India is, I guess, the test pilot for the biometric identification side of all of this. So you yeah, start tying all these things in together, and boy, we're getting close, I think. I, I can't believe with India, uh, due to the nature of the country and, and how many parts of India are essentially like second or third world, how quickly it was like a matter of a year or two that they were able to get all these digital identities for everyone. And I think the populace just really just followed, you know, they were just told and they obeyed. And so you can imagine uh, with India and how much poverty and, and, and people that they have there, imagine how easy it is for them to institute something like that in the U S or, or other first world countries where the, the infrastructure and a lot of the identification systems are already in place. And how is it that the church overall is so silent, so asleep, not seeing all of these pieces being put together? You know, so much of the Bible is prophecy, and yet it's hardly touched. Well, I mean, we're talking about the great falling away. I mean, I think that's something Mike wanted to talk about. Yeah, I, did. I mean, we sort of touched on that with the, the first couple of videos, but um, yeah, uh, lots of people struggled to find fellowship locally to talk about these things. Um, unfortunately, you know, fortunately and unfortunately, um, a lot of the fellowship that we have to rely on is over the internet. And um, it's just true. Not a lot of people are focusing on these times. I mean, even uh, even with me, I've I've tried to find a church that I could call home and that I could have, you know, good, meaningful fellowship and, and talk to people about these types of things. Um, but I could read people that they just thought I was crazy. Mm. Absolutely nuts. Um, and so I just uh, I just really appreciate both of you. I appreciate the people that listen and that I can talk to over the comments and Facebook and everything. And I, and I know I've heard from them as well that um, this online fellowship, even though it's not in person, is just so incredibly valuable because there's just so few of us talking about it. Yeah, I agree. You know, I I, <laughs> I mean, I don't want to parrot everything you just said, but I'm going to parrot everything you just said. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, look, you know, I remember back in the day, you know, when I was, you know, really learning and I was being prompted by the Holy Spirit. I wasn't some nut. Yet I back then I'm talking 30 years ago, people went, you're over spiritualizing. You've gone crazy. And you know what? I was I felt alive. It, it, it You know what I mean? I didn't want to be buttoned in. I felt like, I think to myself, I think of that scripture in Proverbs, you know, King Lemuel, you know what I mean? Who is he? What is his name? What is his son's name? Who has gathered the wind in his fists? You know what I mean? And, you know, and I think about that part when he says, who has gathered the wind in his fists? And you see what John 3, 8 says. Jesus says in John 3, 8, the wind listeth where it will. You hear the sound thereof. But no man knoweth whither it cometh from, neither whither it goeth. So is everyone that's born of the Spirit. We know that the Spirit came in and it sounded, it says, uh, the sound of a mighty rushing wind. In Greek, it said there was an echo from heaven that sounded like a rushing mighty wind. So that wind is representative of that we move in the wake of the Holy Spirit. Romans 8, 14 said, they that are born of the Spirit, these are the sons of God. So are you going to control the Spirit? You know, um, I believe in order. I believe in all that. But let me tell you something. I believe all of us, I think I speak for many of us, you two that are sitting here and others that are going to be listening, that it's like, you know, when you try to put a plant in a pot and you for its entire life, you keep it in a pot. It's a not it's not a happy plant. It's not it's unnatural. You know what I'm saying? You got to put that thing in the ground. And you've got to let it go. 
You got to water it. You got to let it breathe that sun and air, and you got to let it go through all the seasons and it becomes a healthy plant. But when you try to keep everybody controlled, that's what you have. You have multi-generations of people that are so ingrained with a system of doing things that they're scared. But I can say this, there's those of us who are here, like right now we're talking, we, you know, during the week we're in, you know, touch with other people. I'm not talking like, oh, we're on fire for Christ. I'm going to use these, all this uh, Christian, Christian, you know, isms and stuff. We're talking, you feel alive in the spirit. Man, you just come alive when you start really understanding prophecy, when you really start growing up as a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor, not for the display of men's splendor, not for your own display. You know, it says, show yourself approved unto God, not to man, right? And we are a planting of the Lord. And so we bear fruit. That's how we bear fruit is we get down deep. We, we are, we dig down deep into that dirt. That's what it says that you dig down deep in the foundation. You build your house by wisdom as a house builded by understanding it is established and by knowledge, shall all the rooms be filled with all pleasant and, and uh, good and pleasant riches. I call that moving in day, you know? And so God wants us to express ourselves. And enjoy the things that he's written in his book, not to be everybody's stuck. Like, and I got to say one more thing. Is it okay if I just share this one dream that went really fast and it's going to prove my point, okay? Some years ago, I was going to a church and this pastor, he just couldn't break out of just keeping it so sanitized. I'm thinking, my gosh, nobody can grow here. I mean, it was the same thing every Sunday. I thought I was going to go crazy. And so one one day, one night, I had a dream that I walked in through the back of the church and I saw on and all the chairs, you know how it's set up with a aisle down the middle and all the chairs to the right and left. But instead of people, there were all potted plants and he was preaching to all the potted plants. And I even knew in my dream. And then, of course, upon waking, I said, that's how he keeps them. Yeah, that's powerful. Yeah. Sums there, it up. Yeah. Yeah. And I'll it, end it, it right there because I think I've said enough, right? Yeah, that's what I've seen. And, you know, it's not to say anything bad about a lot of these churches because in, indeed they are helping other people in certain that's ways. True. But, yeah, for for some of us, we're beyond that. Um, we need to grow. And I, I, I love the analogy. Yeah, you know, just come to my mind a thought uh, even in worship. There's a couple of songs where – you know, it's just struck me. I hadn't even thought about it before, but where they start talking about rising from the ashes, like one's rising from the ashes of defeat, and it suddenly struck me. It's like, wow, they have actually crossed the rise, the phoenix coming out of the ashes, which is Luciferianism, paganism from way back, and tied it in with the resurrection and and different things. And it's like the average ninety nine point nine percent of Christians wouldn't even think of that, wouldn't even see it. But that's actually where the rising from the ashes comes from. It's the whole Phoenix doctrine, yeah. and it is not mm-hmm. Christianity. And people will be singing in church, adding this stuff into their worship, not even realizing how tainted it, it actually is. Let alone Easter egg hunts and everything else. <laughs> well, I mean, of yeah. course, you know, we all know that, you know, and people will say, well, that's Ishtar. But, you know, that really actually is the goddess of spring. It's a female goddess. People are worshiping. You know, they're like, we're not worshiping. We're we're recognizing, you know, the uh, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, you know, the victory on the cross. Well, why tie it in with mystery Babylon, you know? But okay. we've all we've all become it's been indoctrinated us in us for so long. Yeah, so but it, once you learn, it's hard to Yeah, that's the problem. Participate. Huh? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Even with me now with those worship songs with Rising from the Ashes, it's suddenly, you know, I don't really want to touch them, you know. But anyway, that's a whole thing. Yeah. I don't want to rant about <laughs> it too much because I'm sure it's gonna go people are gonna be shaking their heads already here, but We've kind of covered a lot of different areas today. It's kind of been a little bit all over the place, but I think everything's been important. Um, and Joni, it would be good if you could maybe close out um, with prayer. I'll let Mike have some final thoughts before we go. But folks, I just want to say 
Don't forget to subscribe to our A Minute to Midnight YouTube channel and also Mike's channel, which is uh, On Point Preparedness. And uh, you can give your website as well there, Mike. But folks, yeah, both our channels, you know, I think we're sort of quite keen on doing things together at times like this because we seem to really hit it off and enjoy it. Uh, and yeah, we are run at A Minute to Midnight 100% by donations. So uh, we do appreciate people that help us out. That way you can find some ways to donate on our website if you want to help us out. Uh, minute to midnight.com. We appreciate that. Uh, all the music that you hear in the shows is all stuff I've written and recorded, played myself pretty much. So uh, you can find some free music on our website as well. I've had a few people asking me lately, when is my next collection coming out? I'm aiming to put one out in May with some new songs on it. So that's probably about my rant. Um, Joni, oh, maybe if you could uh, close us out in prayer. and oh, Mike, you could give us the, your website and your YouTube channel first, though, if you want to, and some other words, and then let Joni close out. Yep. So uh, actually, I'm, mo I'm most active on YouTube, so you can just look up On Point Preparedness. But uh, my website is onpointpreparedness.net, and so you'll find there are a lot of ministry items, but again, with my roots and sort of my salvation testimony. I started out in preparedness, obviously, and being a prepper. And so I guess if I can end with any closing words, it's to definitively prepare yourself spiritually for the times that are at hand. Um, but also, I, I really strongly recommend that people start to prepare themselves physically. So as we talk about, you know, taking the mark and the ability to buy and sell. Uh, we're not going to want to take the mark. So we're going to be here for this and we need to prepare other means um, so that we can, you know, sur survive as long as we can and preach the gospel to as many people as we can before the end of the age. Um, so yeah, just prepare yourselves spiritually, mentally, emotionally, and physically. Totally agree. And um, I just want to add, yeah, food, water, sort those things out as best you can, folks, if you can. And we talked about the whole currency thing uh, and the fact that that's going to be going at some point, collapsing or whatever. So if you've got any money left over, I'd suggest maybe putting it into some precious metals as well. Not turning this into a precious metals selling show. We don't sell them, but uh, I do kind of believe that there's some wisdom in that. But make sure you've got the food and water thing sorted first. Would you uh, add anything on that, Mike? Um, well, it's a big, it's a big topic. Um, but yeah, the, the essentials, um, uh, you really just need to think about your food, your water, your shelter, um, you know, as a father or a man of your household, how you might protect your family. Um, all, all these things are important. Joni, so, um, if you've got any last things that you'd like to add, go for it and then close us out in prayer. Yeah. First of all, I want to thank you, Tony and Mike. It was great connecting with you guys again. I hope we can do this again routinely as long as we can get up on YouTube. And um, I do want to also add that Brooke and I have a deliverance ministry called Fire and Freedom. Uh, you can also contact us, you know, you, of course, on a minute to midnight always. But you could also visit us on our website at www.fireandfreedom.org. Or you can email us at fireandfreedom8, that's number eight, at gmail.com. And you can also visit us on our Facebook and also check us out on YouTube. We have our new YouTube channel. So I think it's a great compliment to a minute to mid. I, I think it's um, a great thing to do because... You know, we talk about being spiritually ready. Man, when you talk about being spiritually ready, this church is not ready. So um, it's only two of us and or actually all of us right here, right? You, Tony and Mike and me and Brooke and many others out there. So anyways, I'm going to close in prayer and i um, just going to be really grateful to Jesus Christ right now that we have this time together and just just going to pray. Here I go. Okay. Lord Jesus, we come to you tonight, and we want to thank you so much that, Lord, that we have this privilege and honor, Lord, to be able to come together in your name, making you the centerpiece of this entire discussion. 
because everything we spoke about and all that we are and everything that we do is centered in you, Lord Jesus. And Lord, it is our heart's desire that everything that we have spoken to you about, spoken to each other about, was not just to each other, Lord, but we know that once it's released, it will go on and on and on. And we ask that you anoint and bless this message that it would land on the ears of the people that have ears to hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches as well, Lord, as to people that are searching for you, Lord. And and I just want to say that if you are out there and you have been seeking uh, what it means to be saved, is there an afterlife? What's going to happen to me? You need to be saved. Bottom line, Jesus says, marvel not at this, you must be saved. Must be saved. It said that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus is offering you and ushering you an invitation at the sound of our voices today to come into the kingdom, be saved, confess your sins to the great high priest of your confession, Jesus Christ. Declare to him that you're a sinner, that you're in need of a savior. Um, Be ready for Christ. Uh, Come under his wing of safety and protection and blessing. And with assurance that he will carry you through to the other side into heaven. And Lord, we just ask that you just bless everybody that has listened and and just let this word sink deep into their hearts, Lord. We thank you for your blessing upon us and upon all of those that are hearing you today. In your precious name, we give you praise for you are worthy in Jesus name. We say amen. Amen. Well, uh, thanks, Joni and Mike, for being on the show. It's been great. I had a good time, like always. Yeah, wonderful. Let's do it again soon. Absolutely. 